everyone. It's Carrie from Live Accessible. Thanks for joining us on this live stream tonight. And today we're going to be talking about going to a school for the blind and um, being in a mainstream school. And I hear an echo. So hold on. Let me see. Okay. Let's see here. Okay. I got YouTube playing in the background. So I know we're live. <laughs> That's a good thing. Um, so uh, before we get started, I do want to say that I just started a Facebook group for Live Accessible. So if you guys want to be part of the Live Accessible community, you guys can talk to each other. Um, and I post a lot of things about what's going on behind the scenes. And if you want to know, like, um, be one of the first people to know what kind of videos are going to come up or what live streams and with who, uh, you guys can definitely check that out. I will leave the um, link to the group in the chat. And so without further ado, I want to welcome two of my guests. Um, I have Joy Hu here and Jessica. Welcome, you guys. How are you? Hi, Carrie. We're happy to be here. So happy. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah. And so um, if, if I understand correctly, um, Joy, you went to a mainstream school. Is that right? Yep. And Jessica, what about you? Uh, I went to a school for the blind. Okay. And did you guys do that for the whole um, K through 12? or I did. Okay. Yeah, I did too. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So we're today we're just going to talk about the differences between going to being mainstreamed and going um, being attending a school for the blind. And um, me, I was mainstreamed all the way through. Um, but I want to really hear from Joy and Jessica and from you guys in the chat. If you know, if you're out there, let me know where did you guys go? Um, were you home um, homeschooled or went to school for the blind or were you mainstreamed? Um, yeah, and I know some people also go. Um, school for the blind for a couple years or one or two, three years, and then they switch over to mainstream. So let's first talk about uh, the choice of your parents, I guess, of whether what, what school you were guy you guys were gonna go to. Like um, how did your parents decide which one to send you to? What about you, Joy? Yeah, so um it's funny because I don't really remember it being a conversation. Like it was just assumed that I was going to go to the public school. Mm -hmm. um, we lived really close to an elementary school, like walking distance. Um, and so honestly, I don't even know if my parents knew about a school for the blind. Like I don't think they ever even considered sending me to a school for the blind um, mm -hmm. just because it's, um, I would have had to live there like a board board there um because i think it's like two hours or three hours away from my house so mm -hmm. um it would have been something where i would have been yeah like not really living at home just coming home on the weekends and my parents didn't want that um for me um they wanted to be the ones like main you know obviously the main influence in my life raising me so um yeah, I mean, it was kind of just like assumed that I would go to public school. It was never really a conversation mm. that they had. So so what about when you uh, grew up a little bit? Um, did you want to, did you ever think about going to school for the blind or did it ever something that yeah. you didn't think about or? Yeah, Tell it me. actually, it actually was. Um, I went to a summer camp that this school for the blind um, held in my state and um I loved it. It was so much fun. And my roommate was a student at this school. Sorry, I'm trying to be so careful not to slip and say my state or the school um, <laughs> because this is life. Um, but I, um, I loved it. And so I really wanted to go. And um, my parents were like, no, Joy, this is, I don't think you need to, you don't need to go there. Um, and I think it was it was again they just wanted to be the primary like influence in my life shaping my beliefs shaping my 
um, just like view of the world and myself and, um, and also just they wanted me to be challenged academically. And I think at least at this particular school in my state, um, the academic standards are definitely, definitely lower than what I would be getting at a public school. So, um, yeah, so I, I wanted to go just mainly because I had made friends at summer camp and it seemed like a really cool place. And, um, you know, and my parents pretty much were like, oh, no, you're not going to do that. And I'm, I'm grateful <laughs> that they shot that down, <laughs> honestly. So, yeah. Um, I want to answer a really quick question from Lily, um, who asks, um, is mainstream um, the same as public school? And yes. So if you were mainstreamed, you went to a regular school, not to a school for the blind. I guess it could also be private school or something else. Um, anything that w isn't like a school for the blind. Um, so Jessica, what about you and your parents? How did you guys decide to go to a school for the blind? And when you grew up, like, did you decide to stay there? Or how did that go for you? Yeah, so um, first, you just a little, it's kind of similar to doing kind of different. Um, so the school for the blind that I went to was within a 10 minute drive of my home. So fortunately for me, I was able to come home every day. Like I never dormed, never wanted to. So that was really, really important to me. And I think that if it were in the case of like Joy, where Joy lives and how, how the distance, if I were in that situation, I don't think my parents would have wanted that either. But for me, it was very much, it was nice to be able to come home. Um, I will say a lot of, I think, why I think my parents wanted me to go to a school for the blind was just lack of um, awareness. I'm the oldest child in my family. Uh, my parents were immigrants. My mom had me when she was really young. So right after they came to this country from Guyana, which is where I'm from, so they really didn't know a lot about what was available and what was offered. Um, and I think I did a lot of like early, they did a lot of like early intervention blindness stuff with me. And I think someone recommended where I went to school. Um, and they were like, why don't we try that? Um, yeah, I definitely have to agree with Joy regarding academic standards. And for me growing up, I never felt like I was pushed academically. It was just not something that was very much talked about. So I also was very much like of the opinion, like I want to go to mainstream school. And my parents were like, no, you know, probably not the best option just because again, it's just very much demographics. Like where I live, the school I would have ended up going to was probably not like in the best district or in the best neighborhood, but there were a lot of, I, I don't like, I think if I had the choice, I would have wanted to be uh, mainstreamed purely from like an academic standpoint. But a lot of the reasons why my parents didn't um, want me to be mainstreamed was just due to lack of information and awareness and cultural stuff like that. Gotcha. And so you were never able to choose to go um, later on. Um, no. So, mm -hmm. so I, I'm really curious to hear from both sides. Um, Joy, what were some of the accommodations that, you know, um, being mainstream that you got? Yeah, I think so. Accommodations vary so much from like county to county. I just happened to go to school in a very rich county. And so we had so many TVIs and um, teachers of the visually impaired. And so we had outstanding services where I was. Um, and so, yeah, what it kind of looked like was that um, from a young age, I started receiving early intervention um services when I was three years old, was taught Braille and how to use a cane when I was three years old. And um, pretty much I just had um, TVIs all throughout K to 12. Um, actually, I had a TVI when I was in preschool, starting when I was three. So mm, all wow. throughout my schooling. Um, and I think I had, let's see, one, two, three. I think I had six. I had six TVIs total. And they, my county intentionally... Um, they would have you work with the same teacher for like three years, maybe four years, and then they would switch you to somebody else because they wanted to teach their students how to work with different kinds of people and mm. to learn how to advocate for themselves and to just, yeah, work with different kinds of people. Um, 
just because, I mean, I mean, I was honestly, I was devastated when my first TBI, um, who was with me, um, you know, not just my uh, preschool TBI, but my, my um, TBI who was with me for a lot of my elementary years, when I was taken off her caseload, I was devastated and it was horrible, but I was so grateful that they had kind of made me do that because I think I would have been so dependent on her because she'd almost become like a second mom to me. Um, so anyway, sorry, that's just a little bit of backstory, but in terms of like accommodations, obviously I was taught braille from a really young age um, and that looked like just pulling me out of classes for an hour, maybe a day. And the rest of the time I was pretty much in, in the classroom with the other students. Um, some of that time I would have my TBI in there with me. Sometimes I wouldn't. Um, and then obviously receiving O&M services, um, learning how to use a cane and, um, and those were kind of the big two. And then um, in second grade, I received some technology and started learning how to use a computer and um, a screen reader and how to touch type. Um, and from there, I pretty much um, did both. Like, so I would have to do spelling tests in Braille and on the computer. So I would have to write it out in uncontracted braille and then i would have to write it out in contracted braille mm. and then i would have to type it on the computer because they wanted me to have all of those skills um how to type how to read how to write uncontracted how to um to, so you know to actually know how to spell it um and then to obviously know my contractions so yeah i i would say i had just a lot of expectations placed on me from a really young age um and yeah, and then pretty much just in middle school, high school, what mainly happened was that I would meet with my TBI for maybe 45 minutes to an hour a day, and we would just go over different assistive technology things. Um, I honestly, I took that time to finish tests a lot of the times because especially mm -hmm. in math, my tests would take longer. Um, and yeah, just work on different kind of like daily living skills. Um, and then my, I just had a TBI sit in my math and science classes that were a little bit more visual. And she would often like graph things for me that my teacher was drawing on the board and stuff like that. So um, yeah. So you would have a TBI every day? Is that what I'm yeah. hearing? Yeah. Oh, wow. Had, wow, wow, that is. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I have to say, you, I know people that have been mainstreamed where I live, yeah. and you're very fortunate. Yes. Um, and I think that's partially why mm -hmm. you're successful because yeah. most people do not get that. That's very. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely not. I mean, yeah. I was mainstreamed wow. and I only had a TVI about once every week for an hour yeah. or like once every two weeks. And that was yeah. about it. Yeah. Do you think that shapes your success a little bit, Joy? I mean, I know this is like not. No, <laughs> that's a good question. No, that's a really good question, Jessica. Um, I, I do. And I think so. First of all, I never had a para. Um, yeah, so we get that if, here. Yeah, so if so, for those of um, our friends in the chat who may not know, a para is um, like a I don't know, like a helper person, like a one-on-one. -on -one. Like yeah, like an assistant or something. Um, mm -hmm. And so, a lot of blind students, because they don't have a TBI as much as they need one, they are like, oh, well, you're special ed, you can have a para. And so then these kids are followed around by these like adults who <laughs> don't actually know how to help blind people and like do everything for them and are like, gosh, these kids are like, I don't know, I know one wants to be friends with me. And it's like, well, maybe it's because it you have sense. an adult following you around all mm -hmm. day long. Um, but yeah, That's no, exactly I, the situation that yeah. I was in. Um, yeah, it it is is so, it's so fascinating. Like We yeah. never called it uh, para. Uh, it was just called like a teacher's aide. Um, yeah. But yeah, there was one of those things that I really did not like. Um, yeah, most people, I mean, I know friends, I have friends that were mainstreamed and just yeah. really struggled. So it's such an interesting perspective to hear it from your end, Joy, because yeah. that's not the norm where I live at all. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. yeah. I can answer... Ooh, oh, sorry. I was gonna. No, you're fine. I was gonna ask you, Jess. Is that normal for kids like who are totals? Because I think in my county, if you have more vision, you do get less services. But for me, being a total, like I needed a lot. 
Um, and so like, so I know for me, if a TEI had me, they would only have like a few other kids on their caseload who were, you know, just the kind of one hour a week type of kids because they knew that I was, I needed a lot, right? Because I think I it's very a much um, a wealth gap, you know, yeah. a lot of times here, there's just not a lot of services and there is yeah. not a lot of resources to go around. So I'm trying yeah. to remember people I know that were mainstreamed and I think they got services maybe once or twice a week, if even that, and that includes all of them. So it's very much a privileged standpoint and wealth where yeah. you have, there are more people and there's more availability and you get your needs met. To answer right. your question, Carrie, um, I will say that since it was a school for the blind, um, we didn't really have any specific, like, everything was kind of just already accessible. You know, we had talking calculators and everything mm -hmm. like in Braille and like mm -hmm. there were like tactile maps and um, Braille signage on the doors and stuff like that. So there were really no specific accommodations that needed to be met um, from that viewpoint. Um, just because obviously it's a school for the blind. So everything is kind of already catered to you. I will say from a personal perspective, I'm really, really fortunate that I didn't dorm and me, my sister wasn't born until I was 12. So growing up, my parents devoted a lot of time and energy into me. So like they did a lot of like practice and helping me figure out how to do things and be independent and stuff. Cause yeah. I think that's one of the biggest struggles going to a school for the blind. If you don't have those, you don't really get those advocacy, advocacy skills taught to you because it's just kind of expected that everything is for you. So for me, I kind of had to learn how to advocate for myself. A lot of it's just being um, first generation and having to figure things out that my parents couldn't do. And it's forced me to be a good advocate, but it's helped in a lot of ways because a lot of people I know that go to schools for the blind really struggle with advocacy because it's just expected that when you go there, you don't need to do anything because everything's kind of just done for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So where did you learn, you know, to advocate for yourself since you were going to school for blind, everything was already accessible. Like where were, what circumstances did you practice that? So um, my parents speak broken English, not very professional or proper. So mm -hmm. if a phone call needed to be made or an email needed to be written or a meeting needed to be scheduled, I kind of just had to do that by default. Um, mm. kind of where I picked up a lot of my advocacy skills was just kind of having to figure things out. And that's something a lot of people I know didn't really have to do. It wasn't at school. It was very much at home. And then also just practicing those independent, you know, my parents were like, this is laundry. This is dishes. Do that. Like practice that. So um, again, I guess you can look at it from a privileged standpoint where I lived at home and I was the only kid. So they could really just devote a lot of time and energy to my like development uh, independent skill wise that I didn't get there. Mm -hmm. So what um, what do they do at the School for the Blind in terms of teaching you Braille and O&M instruction? Like, did they take you out of the regular classes? Was there a specific class just for that? Or how did that work? So we all kind of started off learning the same thing. You know, you learn your Braille in like kindergarten and you learn your typing and you practice. And um, as you get older, you kind of get pulled out depending on what you need. So mm -hmm. kids would get pulled out for like additional braille instruction. And some kids would get pulled out for like uh, English is like a second language, you know, help with that or um, occupational therapy, physical therapy, just like whatever additional services you need, they would conform to your schedule. We all got mobility training or O&M training um, once a week and then, or once, usually it was like twice a week, 45 minutes. And then as you got older, it was like once a week for an hour and a half or once a week for two hours and 15 minutes as you learn to do more advanced routes. So mm -hmm. uh, beginning it's kind of all, um, general, but then as you go through, they do a lot of assessments like, okay, how much help do you need with this? Do you need more support or do you need less support or just kind of things like that? So it was very much, um, they, they do a lot of catering to your individual needs. Mm -hmm. So Joy, what about you? When you were mainstream, do you feel that you had enough accommodations? And do you it think- It sounds like you, it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. 
<laughs> I do. I do. I mean, and this is not to say that like things are perfect and peachy and like I never had any issues because that's definitely not true. I had teachers in high school where like there were issues and I had to learn how to advocate for myself in that situation. And that was really hard. Um, and also just like, I mean, I think my parents were really great advocates for me when I was younger and like really modeled how to be a good advocate. So as I got older, I, you know, that, that role kind of shifted to me of, okay, Joy, like you're older now, you can advocate for yourself. This is how you do it. Um, and so, yeah, I do think I, if it's okay, I do want to talk a little bit about like the daily living skills piece that, mm -hmm. you know, Jess has been talking about. I think um, I don't know. I, it's interesting because I think a lot of people send their kids. Um, they just, they make that decision to send their kids to schools for the blind because they think they're going to get better daily living skills. Like, oh, I don't know how to teach my kids how to do laundry. Like, you know, I, I could teach a sighted person how to do laundry. I don't know how to teach a blind kid how to do laundry. I, I just kind of that general thought process. And to be honest, I, so I worked as a camp counselor for two years with um, high schoolers who are blind. And I will just be totally honest and say the kids, well, most of the kids who were, uh, you know, who were blind uh, had very bad daily living skills. And the kids who went to the school for the blind had really, really bad daily living skills. And so I just, I think, you know, just to caution any parent who, I don't know, may come across as that you might think that they're going to get a lot of focused attention on daily living skills, but that may not be true. Um, and that my mom, you know, my dad, but mostly my mom, <laughs> they, she taught me pretty much everything I know about cooking, cleaning, laundry, all of that at home. And Same, yeah. It was and a I think process, but <laughs> we made it work. Same. I, I'm like trying to think. Um, so I never dormed. I never dormed yeah. at all. And a lot of where I learned my ADL skills were at like camps for the blind. Yeah. yeah. Summer mm -hmm. for the blind. Like, cause you know, you would do like, you'd live alone and they teach you how to clean yeah. the toilet and clean the bathroom. Yeah. And then I would come home and my parents would kind of force me to cultivate those skills. Yeah. And it works. Because I live one hundred, I literally live all by myself. No roommates, no housemates, no anything. So I figured out. But um, yeah, my my parents did a lot of like the okay, you have to do this, practice yeah. this, learn that. Very much like yeah. take no for an answer. And yeah. I don't know what they really taught at the dorms because I think I'm guessing a lot of kids that you worked with over the summer were dorm students right they were yeah and i i know just from personal experience because i was at a summer camp at the school for the blind i mean my roommate was 10 years old smart girl right like totally no other disabilities smart very very smart very very high functioning obviously and like she had a dorm supervisor helping her shower when she was like 10 and I was like, what is going on here? And I think it's just because like, there are such low expectations that it's like, I don't know, it, it kind of blew my mind a little bit. Um, there really are. And that was one of the things I really struggled with. Um, I know we haven't gone to the college section, <laughs> yeah. but I will say that when I was applying to colleges, my one thought was make something better of yourself because I felt like the school for the blind the biggest issue I find with schools for the blind are that they have kids of all academic levels so they kind of have to cater whatever the class structure is to that and my graduating class they just were not very academically focused so it just was very boring which sounds really mean yeah. and repetitive and I just I would kind of feel like I wasn't learning so when I was in college I was like okay apply to as many places as you can do as much as you can to kind of force yourself to kind of get uncomfortable and get not you know be be someone different um and make yourself be a little more like push yourself more uh, it worked I got into eight out of the 11 schools I applied to um, <laughs> wow yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, but that was kind of my, my main motivation where I just felt like I was never pushed academically when I was at the school for the blind. 
you know. So it, I have I have a question for you, Jessica. Um, <laughs> when you started college, um, and you coming from a school for the blind, what was it like transitioning to? You know, everybody in the school it was. was so blind or visually impaired and then you were dropped into college where you know maybe you were like the only one or there might have been I don't know how I'm many the but only one. oh yeah I'm okay the only one ever I go to a very <laughs> predominantly pretty affluent private school um mm -hmm. Carrie it was the scariest thing I have ever done in my entire life and that's <laughs> an exaggeration because um, I didn't really have a lot of family members that were sighted uh, that were close to my age. So for majority of my life until I started college, I was just surrounded by blind people. So mm -hmm. I just remember I would audio message Joy and I would be like, how did you make friends? How do you have people? I was like, oh my God, are people like not going to like me? Are people going to be uncomfortable around me? Are people going to be awkward? I will say that what really, really, I found a really good balance where I live, I go to school 45 minutes away from my house. So specifically freshman year, I would come home a lot just because I don't really know anyone. And now it's like, I live close enough where my parents can kind of come and drop stuff off, but far enough where they wouldn't hover. And it really has allowed me dorming specifically, especially during COVID because I dormed during, you know, COVID and had like lived alone and like couldn't go home obviously because risky. So it really forced me to like find my circle and find myself and, it was the most humbling. I remember the first time my friend, I had known who she was first semester and second semester, I was like Saturday morning and she texted me and she's like, you want to go to lunch and get, go to the mall? And I was like, oh, she wants to hang out with me alone and do the driving and the guiding. It was like, I felt so normal. And that was something I'd never really gotten a taste of um, in high school just because I didn't have any sighted friends. And now 98% of my friends are sighted. They all have cars. They all drive. <laughs> they kind of found my community here. Um, and I think that's all just due to dorming and, and having to reach out in a way I never had to do when I was living at home. But it was scary. It was terrifying. Because I just you, didn't know what sorry. to expect. No, it's okay. okay. Yeah, so didn't you also say that a huge piece of that was just like even learning about like what sighted people do and like how they operate and just like little things that were like oh like you can see that or you know just things yes. that like because you had just been surrounded by blind people your whole life and all your yeah life. freshman year i remember i was in a friend's room and i was like look out the window how far do you see and they're like yeah i could see all the way to the dining hall which is like a 10 minute walk and i'm like what so like little and like depth driving, I gotta say driving was the one like the thing that like fascinated me the most where no one I knew obviously in high school or you know throughout schooling at a school for blind, obviously no one I knew had a car where now going to where I go, it's very suburban and there's not a lot of public transport. Everyone has a car. So I would just be like, how do you do that? How do you turn? Like I, my friend, I remember she was like, I turned a few days ago or this morning. And I was like, how do I describe it to you? So like, little things that I don't think about that I had to think about. It was like, it was like a whole world of possibilities that I had never given any thought to just because I'd never had to. So it was very much a huge, huge transition in my life, but I'm really glad I made it. Cause I know, I, I know, I know sighted friends or blind friends of mine who were mainstreamed, who didn't dorm and commute and just struggled a lot and still do socially. So it's really, really helped me living, dorming to kind of be social in a way that I just could not do if I lived mm -hmm. harder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, like going back to the social part, um, what was it like, Joy, for you um, on a social level at a mainstream school? At a mainstream school? Um, yeah. I mean, honestly, Gosh, I hear horror stories just from my my sweet kiddos who, you know, I were my students over the summers and stuff, but just about them getting bullied. And I'm like, gosh, like I was never bullied ever. I mean, college, I, me either. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I think there's a difference between people being like clicky and there's a difference between people maybe like once in a while saying something insensitive or unkind and like downright bullying. And like, I maybe experienced the 
those other things, but I've never experienced bullying. And I honestly, I mean, in I've just always had friends in school. I never really had a hard time making friends. Um, and it, it, it's interesting because like you see this now in adults, but and kids, but like some kids just really got it. Like I had a few friends who were just really good about like describing things to me and it was so natural and they would just naturally guide me and yeah. it was so natural. And then there are kids, you know, who just didn't get it. And they were just like, I just don't understand. Um, yeah. And I mean, like, I mean, I just remember in third grade, third grade was a horrible year because there were two cliques in the class and I didn't fit into either one of them. And I had these girls who were like taking my braille books and like pretending like they could read it. And I don't even know why that made me so angry at the time, but it <laughs> felt like so mean and so like, I don't know. I, I, I need to like do some soul searching to figure out why it like hit a nerve. But yeah. at that time it like, it was like, Oh my gosh, I was so angry. Um, but I mean, really, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, and I would say in high school, well, first of all, I, I would say middle school was like my prime, which I think is like weird. Like everyone hates middle school, but I love middle school. I was in like band, choir, drama I was a musical theater like I had the time of my life and I had so many friends who would hang out every single day it was so great um and then high school I had friends um I don't think I had any like super close friends but I don't I don't think that has anything to do with blindness I think it was just people just drift yeah 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 and so I mean I High school was a really lonely time for me, but like I said, I don't think that had anything to do with not being able to speak. You know, it was just a hard time of life. It's so. funny you say that because I really relate to all of that because yeah. while I went to a school for the blind, I never really fit in with anyone. Um, yeah. I've always been a go-getter, very academic, yeah. very quiet, very much an introvert. So no one really talked to me. No one really liked me. I was just kind yeah. of... Like, I never felt like I made good connections. Um, and I think that's why it was so easy for me to step out and be someone different in college because I didn't, I just didn't love, I really didn't like the experience I had at the school for the blind that I went to. Mm -hmm. too. This lack of academic support, lack of social opportunity. So for me, going to college was like taking a deep breath. Like, I was like, okay, I can start over. I can reinvent myself. And yeah talking about um, bullying and, and lack of friendship and stuff, um, for me, one of the scariest things was last semester and living here and being alone, not knowing. And I just remember being like, oh my God, am I going to get figure anything out? Are people going to still guide and stuff? And people are just inherently kind where I go to school and so helpful. I've had friends show me how to ride a bike and pump gas and taking me to like, show me how to take like a spin class and just... And I think a lot of it is very much attitude based. Like I'm a very relaxed, casual, like I'm not super sensitive. And I think when it comes to, I think a lot of it's like attitude where if you go into a situation expecting people to be like aware and woke all the time about disability, you're in for a rude awakening because people just don't know. And it's not their fault, but a lot of, I'd like make a lot of jokes and I laugh at myself and we talk about blind moments because you, yeah. you to like for me personally I find that people aren't intentionally hurtful they just don't know so I bring on I'm like bring on the dumb questions I'll never like I'll answer anything you know you have to go into it with a positive mindset and I think that's what's really allowed me to make so many social connections where it's like ask me things I'm really open I'm super friendly um I'm super introverted but like I'm I'm very open in the sense of like I'll answer questions because people don't know and I think that's really what's helped me be very socially successful on, on campus, having that open mindset. Yeah, um, I definitely can um, relate to that being, since um, when I was mainstream, I was the only one, you know, in the school. Um, there was my sister, but she graduated, like, you know, she wasn't in the same class as me. And so I was just by myself. I was the only blind person. And I honestly, for me, I felt very out of place and excluded. Um, it, you know, it's, it wasn't just like 
the whole click thing, it's, I think that I just didn't know how to socially engage. Uh, I was definitely more introverted, like Jessica, uh, which is funny because now I have a YouTube channel and I talk yeah. a whole bunch to people. But so do I, for what? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, there would be days that I would just go to school and I wouldn't, I wouldn't really talk to anybody. I wouldn't even yeah. say anything, you know. It's and funny. So I think it's, it's just a person the, thing. Blind school, sighted school. Maybe. That's mm -hmm, that's what I was going to really say. Matter. Um. Yeah. So I think that it's a lot of it is the person. Uh, whether you're a blind school or school for the blind or a mainstream yeah. school, you're still the same person, right? You're just maybe yeah. have a different environment. Oh. And um, so I have a quick uh, question for both of you. Uh, Joy, um, if you went to a blind school from K to 12, mm. do you think that would have changed who you are? That's a really good question. Um, and it's Ooh. hard for me to even like wrap my head around that because Joy has said a lot of times we talk a lot and she's like, you turned out really well for going yeah. to a blind school. And I'm like, I know. I, don't know. A really I feel so bad. I'm not trying to be mean. I've just seen so many kids come through that like, it just is awful. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, how I think a lot of it is for me. I'll, I'll let you answer in a sec, but I think a yeah. lot of it is just personal resilience you know my parents didn't have the opportunity to like pursue higher ed you know there were a lot and still are a lot of very high standards placed on me so i kind of always just went into it thinking okay jessica you're here now but you can always do like there was always something to strive for so i think it's just very much for me it's like an internal drive to do better and to push beyond circumstance but no, Joy has said a lot. She's like, I don't know how you turned out the way you did. And I'm like, I don't know. So I'm interested to hear your answer yeah. to that question. I'm just thinking as you're talking, I think it's funny because I think academically, I would if I'm like you, Jess, like I'm super, like I'm naturally very determined and like very, I just, my family has high expectations. Um, I have high expectations. And so I think I would have found a way to succeed academically, but I almost think I would be very different socially. Um, I don't think so. And I think I'd be different socially <laughs> in a bad way because I am very, like you would probably wouldn't know it because I think I come across pretty confident most of the time, but I am probably one of the most insecure people you would ever meet and I'm very like people pleasing and something I super struggle with like I want to be liked so bad um not to like have a personal counseling session right now but like seriously I do like really care about what other people think and I almost feel like being different um like I was different from my peers in mainstream in that I was blind but like we had a lot of the times we had the same interests. We were all very high achieving. Like we had more similarities than differences. But I always think if I had been in a blind school, like or school for the blind, um, I would have, I would have adapted and tried to assimilate myself to my peers. And sometimes certain blind children who are not taught social skills can have some not so great like social <laughs> uh what's the right word um I don't know like they just they can just be super awkward honestly like for lack of a better word they can oh my god be so awkward. much to respond to with that sorry not sure if you were done um I was pretty much done I think yeah like pretty much um I yeah, so I think I would have been different socially just because I really like to be liked. And I think I maybe would have like made myself, I didn't, I wouldn't have wanted to be different from my peers. So I maybe would have like honestly picked up some really weird blindisms and like really weird, um, yeah, like social skills. <laughs> but it's I mean, so, I don't know, that's like speculation. Oh my God, so many thoughts. Um, I sometimes wonder how I turned out so well socially and how I'm so social right now because. I was very introverted as a child, um, pretty much until I started college. I was very introverted. I didn't have any siblings until I was 12. My sister is 
12 years younger than I am, so there was no bonding there. Um, didn't talk to anyone at school, didn't have anyone to hang out with. And I sometimes look back and wonder, how did I become who I am today, given the circumstances? Because I'm really social right now, which is ironic given the circle, like where we're at COVID wise, but I have an insanely active social life. And I just I can't really like, think about that all. I'm like, how does that work? I don't know. I, I really, I'm like, I don't know. It's funny. Um, and unlike Joy, I've never cared about what other people think. Um, not in a, oh my God, I'm going to be super crazy and extroverted way, but I'm just like, I think just going to a school where I didn't have a lot of interest with anyone, everybody was very focused on like the drama and the pettiness and who was doing what with who, there was a lot of rumors. And I just, I've never liked drama and gossip. I don't care about that stuff. So I was just always... There was never, ever, ever this desire to conform for me. I was like, if you don't like me, don't like me. I will happily keep to myself and be lonely. And I, I was like, you know what? I'll figure it out. Um, so I've never cared about that. I think that if I went to a mainstream school, I would be very, I don't think I would do well just from a social standpoint because I'm very anxious. I'm very quiet. I don't make myself known, kind of keep my head down. It took me a really long time when starting college to find and build long lasting friendships. Um, and in height, like I just, I know myself on, I just seeing millions of people around me talking to each other, interacting with each other. I just would not have known how to fit into the fold. And I think that's what made going to a blind school easy where I was never expected to that. I was always okay being alone, but seeing that so actively in high school, um, in, in a mainstream school, seeing everyone just coupling up and having friends and being with each other, I think it would have really messed me up in a way where I was like, whoa, is there something wrong with me? Because I'm too quiet. Whereas where when I went to school for the blind, my intelligence and quietness was seen as a deficit. I think in a mainstream mainstream school, it would have been seen as like a disadvantage because I don't make myself known. So very much the opposite of what you said, Joy. Yeah, that's really interesting because I am naturally an extrovert and you're naturally more of an introvert, but it almost seems, I don't know. I think typically like extroverts don't care as much what people think. I don't know. There, it, it can all, it can all exhibit in different ways, but um, it's really, yeah, uh, it's really don't go ahead and finish. Yeah. Oh no. I'm, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> so like from my perspective, I was mainstream, um, but I did go and attend like camps, summer camps for the blind and where we did learn all those skills. We learned uh, some braille, we learned about, you know, um, and that was really, those times were my first experience being with other children who are uh, blind and visually impaired that aren't part of my family. Um, and that actually for me was so helpful to know that I wasn't the only one out there because that's kind of how I felt like I was on an island like it was all just me um yeah. even <laughs> even though like you know my family is also um visually impaired and and blind um but I, I, like I, like I said in in I was in mainstream school I'm like Jess I'm more naturally introverted but I'm a little bit like Joy because I was like I wanted to be part of the crowd I wanted to have that affirmation you know and so so I really struggled with that like in mainstream school and the thing is like I would go to those camps but then I would have to go back to school where I was the only one uh who was you know legally blind who had a disability and the thing is with me it it was more a little bit more visible because of how my eyes move. Um, you know, it's so, something that I can't control with my nystagmus. It just my eyes constantly move around, and because I, you know, I'm not, it's not using braille. I have to look at the paper really closely, or I have like this big huge machine, <laughs> like the CCTV that I have to use, and so. It, in a way, like mine was a lot more apparent and it really um, made me stand out more in the mainstream school as opposed to, I think, a little bit like with Joy. Uh, you know, you, you have Braille books, but, you know, you might do some things in a different way. But I mean, at least I, I can't see you very well, so I don't know. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> but you know, for the most part, um, you look. Uh, I guess, quote, more normal sure. than like somebody like me. It's not like a stereotype. That's so fascinating. And yeah. 
yeah. perspective, I have not once never thought about just due to the yeah. fact that I have always been around blind friends, like blind people, always, always, always. Mm-hmm. So it's the reverse where I was going into the side of the world, like, oh, it's like you're just dropped into the middle of a desert, like, whoa, I'm the only one here. So it's so interesting. And then, um, I and think- mm-hmm. And, well, and actually, like for me, it was actually the opposite, Jess, um, because because I was mainstream like my whole life. I like it's like this weird thing because yes, my family is blind, so they kind of know, but but I don't know. It was not like something. The wider that I, world. It was like normal at home, I guess, but I never really accepted or embraced it or like. I came to terms with it until which is kind of really funny like you know uh, after hearing you Jess until I went to a um, a place uh, where they hire a lot of blind people and, mm-hmm. um, and and I saw like other people like being normal um, well not, wow. not everybody was normal because you know there's always people yeah. that are normal <laughs> but you know I mean there were normal blind people just like yeah. there were sighted people it like it was like this really interesting mix of both and yeah. then I saw um, people who were blind that you know they they did they worked in the office and they worked I mean like on both sides and that's when it, it was also because I was from New Jersey uh, coming from the northeast going to North Carolina which is in the south and like right. everybody right. talked to each other right and uh-huh. then they're like and I'm like that's when I came out of my shell and I'm like everybody's like hey how are you going and I'm like who are Whoa. you? What's going on? Why are you talking to me? And then, <laughs> and then, so like it was then that I started opening up, talking more, being more social, yes. as opposed to like in mainstream school where I had like one best friend, um, yeah. you know, and, and that was about it. So it's really interesting to hear like the different perspectives because, mm-hmm. you know, I always. I, I always kind of felt like I didn't have enough services um, in mainstream school. So like part of me would wonder, I wouldn't really want to go, but I would wonder about like a school for the blind. Like, you definitely what? get the services there. Like I can't deny, like you really, really, that I think was really helpful just having so much access to things and not having to struggle to get things done. But Joy, I want to know, because this is such an interesting conversation. <laughs> Ever an aha moment like there are other people like me was there that sense of feeling different feeling uncomfortable yeah. because I have always been around blind people you know for me it was going from blind to sighted but was there was there ever like a, a wow like there are more like me moment like for you so again our county is really rich and so like I said we had a lot of we just had a lot of blind kids so I was the only blind student at my pretty much all throughout, I mean, in elementary school, um, I was the only blind student up until fifth grade, and then a family with um, several blind children moved, and they started coming um, to my school, and so at that point, there was three blind kids at the same school, but that was only for two years, so I, um, from kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth grade, it was, I was the only one, and then in middle school and high school, again, I was the only one. Um, high school, I think I ha- there was one other student who was a high, like a high partial. Like you would never know. Um, she didn't use a cane. Like you, would, you would never. I think she could even drive using certain glasses. Like you would never know. Um, but that being said, um, we just had a lot of like we would take field trips like with our vision program. So we would have. Um, you know, a lot of TBIs and their students and we'd all get together and go to a petting zoo or go to a farm or go to, um, we, we, um, went to this, um, shop that was owned by a blind man and we, um, we just like did things together. And so there was never a like, oh, there are more blind people because I was always around, even though I wasn't around them in my school, like we would get together on joint things multiple times a year. Mm -hmm. Um, there's just, we have a lot of blind kids because we have a lot of good services in our County. So, um, yeah, I would say like, for me, there wasn't really that aha moment, but I do have to say when I, after I graduated from undergrad, I 
um, I graduated a semester early so that I can have a few months to get some additional blindness training. Um, and that was made probably one of the most empowering experiences I've ever um, experienced because that was when I was around blind, like all blind people all the time. And I was able to like be a leader in that kind of situation. I hosted people at my apartment like every day and made dinner for everybody, which I never felt comfortable doing with my sighted friends. I don't know why it, it almost feels like sometimes when you're around sighted people, you're not that you're always disadvantaged, but you're always kind of There's like a moment. You're just waiting. You know, I've spilled things. There's always like a, like a like, like, yeah, like there's like a delay even like you're, you're just waiting for and, something to happen and for them to say yes, something. Yes. And like in when I went to this training program, I was like, oh, I can be a leader. Like, why am I not doing these things? And and I learned how to do them, you know, in that type of environment and was able to transfer that over after I left to other environments and to take more of an active role, like with sighted friends, because like, I know none of my sighted friends are looking at me being like, oh, like, she you feel you know, it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, they're not looking at me being like, oh, she can't do it as well as I can. Like, I think that's that, that was a self-inflicted thing. So, yeah, I think yeah. that's something I wish we got more of. Um, I know for me, one of the big things going to school for the blind where they're at least not high academically was like, oh my God, are there no good blind people in college? Can blind people not get right, to right. I remember for me going off to college, I was like, oh my God, I don't know any blind person that's gone through, you know, undergrad that's done really well. That's so like, wait, that was something that worried me. And then even just like, yeah. there was no, I don't, I've never really been shown in school, like in elementary, middle, high school. Okay, you can be blind to get married. You can be blind and have kids and have a full-time job. It's not until having a network with other blind people, doing YouTube, seeing Joy's channel and realizing, oh my God, she's an under, I remember like, I started talking to her and I was like, I have so many questions about how you did it. Cause like, I didn't know anyone that, you know, was very successful. And then like Joy said, you know, afterwards, like blind people are capable of anything. And I think like, yeah. that's something at, at school for the blind, we're not really even taught that cause they're just such low standards. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think that there are um, people who do go to school for the blind temporarily. So they, they don't necessarily go from K through 12 like you, Jessica, or, uh, you know, are mainstreamed for their whole, um, for their whole, uh, you know, what do you call it from K through 12. Like there are some people in the chat that are talking about how they went to a school for the blind for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, and I know some people that just went for a year or two or three years just so that they could learn some of those tr um, things like Braille and O&M instruction have a more um, focus on those types of things. And then they trend either they transition to um, to back to mainstream. I yeah, you it's we're both from very black and white ends of this. Yeah. Yeah, spectrum sure. here um sure. also i never you know again it's and then i obviously i didn't live there so very different perspective than someone that like because i do know people that went and would just dorm monday through friday and then would come home on weekends um just but i never wanted to do that um and then you know joy went mainstream all her life i went to blind school all my life so yeah. there's a lot of nuance to it but i think like what you said earlier carrie really stood out to me. It's like, we are still the same people, you know, no matter what circumstance, I think we would turn out more or less the same, maybe with different kind of ways of interacting. But I think I would always be an introvert, blind school, mainstream school, you know, so I would probably always be an extrovert. So yeah. I like to have this talk because it just, I, it's nice to like, see like, okay, I don't know, you know, I think that we, our circumstances don't really shape who we are that much. We are just so intertwined personality wise. So that was, a, I love that question because it really forced me to think, I don't know how I would do in a mainstream school. Not sure if I'd be the same. I think I'd be a lot more hesitant and cautious. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think like we were influenced by those things. Like I know my mainstream experience definitely influenced me, but it was not like a determining thing about like my core 
personality or identity. Does that make sense? Like, I think yeah, there's a difference exactly. between like influence versus like determining mm-hmm. something. So yeah. like our environment shapes us in part, but it doesn't yeah. define everything about us, no. you know? No. Uh, so I really enjoyed this conversation. It's so fascinating. I think that whether you are mainstreamed or go to school for the blind, and both of you are a testament to this, that, you know, you can achieve so much and be successful. And look at the two of you. You guys went to college. Without a doubt. And, and um, I think that that message, especially for students who go to schools for the blind, needs to be enforced more personally. Because... I think for me, where I go to school or where I went to school, I was very much the exception to the rule. Um, yeah. Like Joy said, she worked with a lot of kids who go to schools for the blind. I know a lot of kids who've gone to schools for the blind, and they just, it's a very low success and retention rate. And I've done a lot of public speaking at my school, and I'm like, listen, you need to like be more hard on them. You need to set more standards for them. Like, yeah. So you can, and I think that's something I want to I emphasize a lot where, I went from K through 12 and now I'm doing wonderful. And I just don't think they're just really low standards. Um, there are. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, I, like I said, I know so many kids um, who went to blind school, school for the blind. I'm sorry. <laughs> I feel like blind school does not sound good. But, um, <laughs> um, who are just, they're so smart, but, and they, I have, one friend in particular who has said in the past, like, they screwed me over. Like, they really screwed me over because they, like, she doesn't even have, like, a full, like, high school diploma because they were, they just told her, like, she couldn't do it. And that makes me so angry because she is so smart and so bright and so capable. And she should have been given that opportunity. And, like, she should have been able to make that choice. Um, But she wasn't. And, you know, I, I know another, another girl who was in my, um, we went, um, sorry, I'm trying to not say too much identifying information. We pretty much, we were in the same, um, freshman class going to college and, um, I had never met her because she had gone to the school for the blind for a few years. She was not in it the, her whole life. Um, she does have quite a bit more vision than I do. Um, But she told me she was the only student in her class to like graduate and go to college. So was I, yeah. Yeah, like no one else in her entire class did that. And I I don't know. I was one out of three, but I think the two, I don't actually keep in touch with anyone, which is a testament to how awkward and isolated I was there. But I think they, one out. I was one out of three, but I think the other two people, have since dropped out or taken semesters off. I don't really know, but there were just, and I was in top class of 10. So yeah. seven people didn't pursue higher academic education. Um, and it's just the standards just, I think I'm just ridiculously resilient. I don't even know. Cause I know a lot of people that just did not do well, did not want to make anything of themselves because they were never pushed to yeah. do better. Well, and it seems like your parents really played mm-hmm. a really important role in that and shaping that in you to to be high. Oh, without a doubt. To want yeah. to be successful. So I think that, that, that is definitely a huge factor. Uh, I yeah. think that a lot of the times parents, especially when, when they don't have any experience with blindness, um, they don't know what to do, whether it's on a cultural level or, or whatever. Um, well, they think that this is the right decision, right, uh, to, to take their child to school for the blind. Um, and, you know, it, it, I really think it depends because if, if it's a couple of years just mm-hmm. to, to k- get a head start with things, especially if the child is going through sight loss, right? So there's a lot of people that I know that they lost significant amounts of vision. So they were like, you know, visually impaired and then they started losing more sight and like actually having everything accessible and having everything like uh, just help them out a lot um, to go back to mainstream setting. So for you, Carrie, you had a family of blind people, like Mm -hmm. with like certain standards or were they just accepting? Were they just very like, you can do whatever you want? Like, what was that like for you? (laughs) Honestly, like my parents never let me like use 
the blindness as an excuse. Yeah. But at the same time, um, they weren't really involved so much. So at the same time, it's like, okay, you do whatever you want. Uh, and if something goes wrong, then we'll step in <laughs> and, like, you know, talk about this. Do you think that was because they were aware of your visual impairment? I mean, my parents, being an only child, they're just very spoiled, like overprotective, unsure. Um, oh, that's another thing that I forgot to mention, like me being around blind people, me going to college for the first time, my mom was, my parents, or my mom specifically was like, oh my God, you're going to be in a whole new environment. Like she was terrified. So there was like that very much overprotective aspect. And for me going to college, being able to be, I'm going out with this friend and they're going to drive and it's going to be cool. Like that sense of independence was huge. Mm -hmm. I think it's just, I, I just, it's so interesting because your family was like, you know, blind and visually impaired. So they just had awareness. So I think it must've been nice for you to be able to be like, okay, they'll let me figure it out in a way where my parents mm -hmm. blind and having all blind friends until I started college were incredibly overprotective. Yeah. I mean, when I was younger, um, my parents did definitely step in because they did want to put me in like, you know, special ed classes. And I mean, I moved here when I was three from Philippines. So I didn't know English. So this is part of the reason why they were like, oh, you know, there's something wrong with her. <laughs> she needs to take like, you know, be in this class in the special ed. And um, but my parents are like, no, she just doesn't. She just doesn't know English. Um, yeah. And she's totally fine. Um, but but as I grew older, I, I really learned basically to advocate for myself because mm -hmm. nobody else would do it. No, <laughs> I mean, yep, same boat, exactly the same. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Like my, my parents, um, if there was really a problem, they would definitely step in, but you know, they, they had a lot of other things going on too. My mom, um, because my sister's visually impaired, my brother's deaf, um, my grandma stayed with us. And so she, for her, it, she had the financial burden of like having a job and she was doing it in the city, she, in New York City. And, you know, she was just, she didn't have time for it. And sure. so my dad too, she was working. And so I, I had to do, I, I was responsible for pretty much See, everything. Yeah, my grandma lived with us just to help kind of my mm -hmm. me, but. My parents always worked nine to five. My dad still works five days a week. Like economic, mm -hmm. never able yeah. to fully, you know, stay at home mom, doing all the car. Mm -hmm. just not in the car. <laughs> they also just didn't have green cards, didn't have citizenship until very recently, actually. So there was just a lot of like, yeah. hustling, <laughs> I guess you could say, for them to try and like figure out their footing coming here as immigrants, not like having a lot of money figuring out life mm -hmm. yeah not that I was ever like they gave me what they had but mm -hmm. yeah yeah to, like take that step and do that push and like figure out things for myself and it's definitely made me really really resilient and I wouldn't be the person I would be mm -hmm. my parents mm -hmm. if my mom had, had the time to just be there for me and coddle me I, it would just I wouldn't have been able to be me if that makes any mm -hmm. sense yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I can, I agree with that. Um, mm. So this is why, like, because of my parents, you know, doing that, I, I basically just learned from experience and did it myself. And like I said, yeah, it makes it was, you more me, it was resilient like, and independent. Never gets done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, what were you going to say, Joy? Oh, I, I wasn't actually... Oh, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, but this was such a great conversation. It's uh, already past 1030. And I know the two of you have classes tomorrow uh, because you guys are in college. And I'm so, so interested, though. I feel like I could talk for hours. Do we, do we have any co like questions? In the yeah, time? before we end, any questions, yeah. comments, thoughts? So, okay, there was one comment that I want to touch on, Um, like, some of the people in the chat were saying that their school had a VI room, like for, for I guess, for people who are visually impaired. And I'm like, wow, that is amazing. Like, I was the anything? only person who in my school. And yeah. so we didn't have a room like that. Did you have one like that, Joy? I know there was a couple we, other well, students. Well, we did. Um, yeah, because, well, so, and yeah, in elementary school, I mean, I think my – 
it was mainly like my TBI's office, right? And she would have her mm, braille embosser, okay. she would have her scanner, she would have all the things we were doing. Um, so for a while, when I was in elementary school, my um, TBI would do a little bit of CCTV work with me. I she would write like one letter and only on a certain like contrast, I could see it. <laughs> and they were kind of just trying to like keep my eye muscles working or something. And then they were like, okay, like this is a waste of time. Like, <laughs> why are we doing this? Um, but yeah, so we had like my CCTV in there. So we, we did have like a room where we stored all of my Braille, my Braille textbooks, embosser, all of those things. Um, yeah. And then when we had, so, you know, the three of us buying students for just two years, um, we had a really big kind of room and um, yeah, had just, I mean, just, I mean, Braille just takes up a lot of space. And we, I just remember my, my TVIs making me like diagrams of insects and they would make, you know, raise line <laughs> wow, drawings. Wow, that's amazing. Doing, yeah, all sorts of things with me. And um, so it just, you had we had so a lot much of support. Time. Like it literally yeah, amazed and, me. I know. To no end how much support you yeah. have from well, people I, in our I, mainstream. I had a really I'm like, TBI too, because like we would, um, I remember really clearly we were learning about different Native American tribes and um, like their teepees and log cabin things and all the other students had to draw a picture of like a, I can't even remember what t tribe it was, but um, of a, like a, traditional you know cabin with like the smoke hole in the top and everything and I got to make one and my TV and I and TBI and I worked together and we made this like epic like log cabin and I remember one of the kids in my class being man that's not fair I wish I was blind it's a lot more fun being blind. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, yeah. it's funny Joy I feel like you've talked about your mainstream experience but I never yeah. Because I know people that are mainstream, like they would never, you know, they're lucky if they see a TBI once a week. And I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, it really isn't. It's such a privilege. And I, I don't even realize how privileged really, truly I am because that was just my experience. I never knew anything else. So. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Blind Toes said, uh, going to public school really helps your social abilities and learning social cues. So I want to like touch on this because I, no, I, I knew. Disagree with that. I think that you can, for me, what helped my social skill was being out of the environment I was in where I just had to take a step and figure out how to be social in a way I'd never had to be. Uh, I had to do a lot of reaching out and contacting and asking friends and finding support. But I definitely don't think that one hinders your social ability more than the other. Because I've been, you know, to one since I was kid, you know, in kindergarten through 12th grade, and I'm really, really, really social now. So I don't, I don't think that there's like a correlation. I, I, I don't know. Maybe it would have been different if I were a commuter or didn't go to college. But for me personally, it hasn't. I don't think being a blind, being going to a school circle blind has really hindered. Yeah, for me, I don't social think skill. that going to a public school really helped my social abilities <laughs> at all. Like, I mean, I, okay, so I think there's a difference. Like, it, I don't think it helped me socially. Um, but at the same time, I understood the environment of being around sighted people. Yes. So and again, I think for me, it's also very much a privilege thing where I just have really, really nice friends that would answer all the dumb sighted people questions I would ask. So that's a form of privilege where just people are just kind enough to, to do that. So looking at it that way. Yeah, that's, that's interesting because I feel like in some ways I do agree and in some ways I don't. Um, because I do agree in that, like, I don't, and maybe you guys talked about this too at a school for the blind, but I know like my TVIs are very intentional about teaching me certain social things. So like looking in the direction of someone talking to you, not slouching over, having good posture and trying your best to look someone in the eye, obviously like not exactly, but to to try really hard to like have your head up and um, cause so many blind people like have their head down and they like poke their eyes, rub their eyes, try to like self stim. Um, 
And so I, you know, I was never allowed to rock. I was never allowed to like hand flap or like, and that was a lot of my parents too. But oh, my parents that, too. Yeah. I, I think, think that sometimes, um, sorry, Jess. Um, no, it's okay. Sorry, I thought you were done. No, sometimes I think um, at schools for the blind, that's just like, it doesn't seem to be addressed as much, at least out of the kids I've seen come out. Yeah, of not school. where I was from. But then again, a lot of people that went to my school were, um, or in my class, really, I don't really know if it was addressed a lot in other classes, but I was really the only total in my class. So, yeah. um, but I don't think it was addressed a lot. Um, my parents also really drilled into me, like, don't do that. Stop it. Like, yeah. I'll put hot sauce on my fingers once to talk me out of the habit of it. It worked. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it worked. My parents. Always That's tried to so make me as, yeah, they, they, brown people don't mess around. <laughs> um, parents always try to make me as socially, uh, not normal, adaptive I mean, as possible. Yeah. Like, if there's a better word, I'm like seizing it, but yeah, I was, oh, the head down thing, I just have really bad posture to begin with. So I think that's the only thing that I struggle with, but the eye poking, the rocking, the flopping, that was just grilled into me to yeah. not be nope. the current thing. I oh, don't yeah. think there was a lot of emphasis at the school for the blind I went to. Yeah. So Let's see in that, thank goodness your parents did that, right? Because if you oh, lived there, I mean, definitely. gosh. Yeah. So Lily has a question. Um, what do your TVIs do in college for you guys um, that's different than K through 12? Um, and what's the difference in help? For so you school don't get in college TV. and pandemic. Okay. So you don't get TVIs in college. Um, mm -hmm. And that was something that I probably forgot to talk about where everything at school for the one I went to was just adapted. And I'm the only blind student here. So kind of the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So I had to do a lot of, I was like very much the squeaky wheel of you have to do this and this and this. Like I had to do a lot of advocating because in college you don't really get a TVI. You have a disabilities office. Mm -hmm. um, and you kind of go to the office and you tell them what you need and they do it for you. And for me, going to a relatively small school, I had to do a lot more advocating than I think someone going to a super big school would have had to do because we didn't really we don't have embossers. Like we don't have the capabilities to get a lot of things adapted. So a lot of it was like meetings and figuring things out and how to get things done. But you don't have um, there are no like TVIs specifically in college. And then college in a pandemic so all my classes are online but Wait, really quick jessica before you talk about college in the pandemic i do want you to mention about what you advocated for in college that really yes. helped you <laughs> so i was able to get ira access free IRA access on my campus because i did like a news story with pix 11 and i was like to my disability i was like listen i need help reading menus and accessing pdfs and getting images the things that your disabilities office just does not have the capabilities to do. Could you fund this for me? And they did. But again, it's also a very privileged thing because my school is very, very, very affluent. So they had the money to do it, but they did. So we, my school is, I think, the only New York school to have IRAX. Oh, well, there goes identifying information. But the only school in New York to have IRA access. Um, so that was a cool thing. You know, I really got to use my advocacy skills for like some good use there, but yeah. Gotcha. And um, so somebody here, uh, I want to mention um, a, a look, wait, a look inside a blind life. And she's saying that she's going to college in the fall to be a preschool teacher. And I want to someday work with blind preschoolers. And I'm so excited for the new chapter in my life. Yeah, that's really exciting. Awesome. That's great. Cool. It's such a good um field and more people yeah. need to do it yeah you can totally do it and don't let anyone tell you that you can't like keep track of kids safely because it's just a lie so totally is they're totally blind is. parents oh yeah i mean i was i was with my friend yesterday and she has an eight-month-old baby and i was like i told her that her baby was like pulling on her cord across the room. So, you know, <laughs> you don't need to have eyes to keep track of kids. We notice more than sighted people do. Yeah, yeah for sure. And um, 
Ineko Gary says, I am deaf blind. Uh, went to, to, I guess he went, oh, oh, went blind at six months and started losing my hearing at uh, 11 years old. And my blindness is from my birth. Um, mom, oh, wow, abusing me. Oh. Wow. I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Lily says, oh, so now I know where to go to college in a couple of years. Thanks for saying that. <laughs> and she's got to go. Um, okay. Yeah. So, oh, and Blindso says, that's awesome. Um, I think he's talking about Ira. So, but yeah, I think that, hello, where did Jessica go? Uh, I think she I just, did she disappear? Uh -oh. uh, yeah, she, oh, there she is. Okay. Jessica? <laughs> Hey, yeah, sorry. I pulled the thing by accident. Oh, no, it's okay. Don't worry. I got <laughs> you. About that. She's back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you know, from, I don't know much about being deaf blind. Um, I, you know, we have experience with blindness and my brother is deaf, but, you know, we don't really have, um, and my dad, he's losing, uh, he, he's totally blind and he's losing his hearing. Yeah. But, um, you know, I can't imagine, you know. I also don't being, know. Uh, it's such an interesting, like, experience. Just the idea, like, I don't know anyone either. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Lily also says a small, uh, I think she went to a small school and they don't have um embossed i guess she means embosser either but her tbi helps her out a lot yeah. so yeah like and and i know um from experience like we didn't have an embosser either um i guess they didn't really need to have one since i didn't really use braille um but but still um it's not you know like a lot of the teachers in mainstream schools don't know what to do with somebody who's blind they yeah. either like i mean i I will say, like, to Jessica's point and Joy's point, that uh, f you guys have been talking about how, like, a school for the blind has lower expectations. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I mean, honestly, in mainstream school, that can happen, too. Totally. I yes. had an Italian yeah. – well, I had a teacher, uh, and I literally – it was – I didn't like it <laughs> um, at all, and – I did horrible at that class. Like, I should have failed. And I slept through class. I didn't pay attention at all. And she gave me an A or B. I can't uh, remember. But, you know, one of those. Yeah. She, she just passed me because yeah. a lot of it was like, oh, she's fine for her. I think a lot okay. of it, again, is like where you go to school, what resources you have, what the demographic looks like, what the surrounding area it looks like it's very macro kind of like or macro environment and like what's around you and what those standards are where joy you said it yourself you went to a very affluent community very high standards lots of services so i'm sure for you you had all those services those services so there was like no reason for you to not yeah do that. yeah yeah i mean if i had done badly in school that would have been totally on me Totally. Because you had everything. Yeah, yeah. Just kind of there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and there's somebody here that's saying that they're, they attended a technical college when I was 16 and 17, and I completed online courses through Hadley Institute for the Blind. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, cool. That's cool. I've yeah. always wanted to do that. Yeah, that's neat. That's you know, cool. Are, have you guys ever done distance learning at all for college or have you guys only gone to the campus? Oh, no, I have done distance. Well, so I live on campus now, but all my classes are virtual. So I have <laughs> distance learning from March of 2020 to right now. So it's been about a year. Um, it's been interesting. Um, Ira has helped a lot with that. <laughs> also um, again come from a place of privilege where a lot of professors here are just very knowledgeable very kind very affluent so you know if things needed to be done I was able to just kind of get that done due to demographic uh, stuff so I've really not had any kind of struggle with accessing materials and 
getting professors to understand. But then I also do a lot of advocating for me, squeaky wheel, grease kind of thing. But distance learning has been interesting. I really do miss the in-person aspect. Mm. Don't I? Yeah, so I, I have done distance learning, but I actually didn't do distance learning until grad school. So right now mm. I'm in seminary getting my master's in counseling. Um, and so that's been kind of an interesting experience um, because, um, so yeah, so in my undergrad, I went, so Jessica went to a small private school. I went to a huge public school. <laughs> so like 30,000 students, huge. We have five um, wow. for context. Yeah. Yeah, so very large, um, and I was, again, <laughs> very well supported. My disabilities office was amazing. They bought like a really expensive Braille embosser that could do tactile graphics because I just, I needed it with the kind of classes I was taking for my major. Um, I took like multiple neuroanatomy classes, like I, I needed tactile images. And so they, the school allowed them to spend money on that. Um, and so, yeah, again, I was very, very well supported. Like I had Braille, I had everything I needed. Um, definitely, absolutely had to do a lot of advocating. There were times where things weren't perfect, but generally speaking, I had everything I needed. And so now being in a seminary where there is no disabilities office, like that doesn't exist. Um, it's been kind of like a hodgepodge patchwork. Um, and so, yeah, so, I've been doing, I'm honest, right now I'm in a um, distance learning class. Um, I'm taking three in person, one distance. And um, yeah, I mean, it's been fine. I mean, for the most part, everything is accessible. And um, yeah, I'm sorry, there's kind of, I don't know where that's coming, but there's like kind of a lot of background noise on someone's. And um, I don't think it's mine. <laughs> Yeah, sorry about that. Um, okay. no, yeah, I'm a little ADHD, I get a little easy. Oh, okay. <laughs> but no, um, but yeah, no. So overall, like distance learning has gone really well for me. But and again, I think it's so just interesting, you know, where I go to school, go to a college that has a lot of funding, and Joy went to a college that has a lot of funding, like yeah, uni, like city universities or small like community colleges, like probably don't have like money equals resources and money equals privilege. Yeah and access that's something absolutely that's not talked about a lot where you know i have ira and i have things that a lot of friends you know i have friends that are doing distance learning that are blind that just really struggle to get access and to spend yeah. money on you know joy had like services five days a week and you know, yeah. mm -hmm. foster with Brett. like it's just it really is dependent on like financial stuff and that's yeah like, and this like, thing awful. like with Pablo right now, he's doing his master's um, and remotely, and you know, it's cool. They don't even provide a lot that much of um, accessibility help. I mean, they try, but you know, they say that when it's remote, they don't really have to help all that much, or that's not much that they can do, apparently. Um, but they try, um, but there's just not enough money or resources. and you know, professors, sometimes they don't understand. Um, yeah, and really quick to touch mm -hmm. on somebody's question about IRA. Mm -hmm. IRA is a service um, paid and free. There's some free promotions to it that uh, you connect somebody using a smartphone um, with somebody who is a trained agent to help with anything visual. So with reading or with um, just identifying or anything in their environment, or even they can go onto your computer, computer. and use Team Viewer um, and help you out with things that are not accessible. It's funny you say that about Ira because I, I I feel like everything's virtual. So like all the PDFs are accessible to me because they're accessible to everyone. And all the quizzes are accessible to me. They're accessible to everyone online. So I really don't use it. And then I feel bad that I don't use it because I have it. I just don't need to use it. But yeah, um, but I just, there is, it's not talked about enough. And I think a lot about like, where would I be if I could only afford to go to like a small, like, or a city college that just didn't have resources or 
Okay. Well, the thing is like, that not all PDFs are accessible. And, right, right. Uh, you well, know, and professors, like, I had, <laughs> the other day, uh, Pablo's, like, you know, getting ready for summer semester, and he asked for, oh, what book are we going to um, use, right? So he could go ahead and do the whole uh, process of making it accessible. And the teacher, uh, unknown to Pablo, like, sent him a picture. And Pablo's like, oh. okay, so where's the information? And the teacher's like, oh, I sent it to you. It's in the and image. So, so, like, Pablo's, like, scratching his head, like, uh, okay, where is it? Uh, um, so he sends it to somebody else. And they're like, oh, yeah, he sent it in a picture. And then, <laughs> so, like, oh it's, like, those God. little things that they don't think about, yeah, um, that they don't realize, you know? Um, and then a lot of the platforms that are online are not that accessible or they have yeah. so many accessibility problems online yeah. we i use, mean our online one is good and then we use zoom for everything thank god <laughs> yeah but like he's not doing um like you know for zoom and so it's, it's asynchronous. Not an actual like, class yeah it's yes yeah. it's asynchronous and so so like all of the material is already there and he has to go into like <sighs> different platforms to do it right and so that's the oh, problem that that's kind of like not, doing like modules and stuff yeah yeah. Oh. yeah so that's it's not always accessible so that's that's the thing even like you know a powerpoint things like that everything's so graphic and and really right now he's doing like business analytics which I'm like I, I don't like math so much so I don't know how he can I could do it never do that <laughs> So like awful. they gave him, they gave like all the students uh, an Excel add-on, um, and it's, you know Excel is uh, accessible, but the add-on is not. <laughs> so oh, it's no. like, oh yeah, because like when you're doing fancy, I took a stats class that was mm. asynchronous, and we used Excel, and you have to like get the add-on, and like Excel works, but like the little thing that you need to go into in Excel, yeah, no, mm -hmm. that's not accessible thing. at all. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's awful. <sighs> Uh, case in point, I guess there there are so many factors to determine one's yes. success, and I really it kind of bothers me. Like we should all be given the same opportunity, the same yeah. ability, the same accessibility, and we're not. We're not. Well, yeah, I and I feel very passionately about people not getting braille and being forced to do aud everything auditorily because I'm like that that's like telling like I don't know I, I can't even think of a good analogy off the top of my head but I just think like that's another mode of acquiring information and like that is not equal access you it's not I mean? and I will say it's, firsthand it's like I don't use braille a lot but when I've had to read powerpoint slides when yeah. I've had to take notes in meetings because I'm an yeah. intern and I have like individual clients for my major doing social work like when I have to read data out loud, like Braille, so useful. Yeah, yeah. Well, and like I just, without Braille, I couldn't have taken 90% of my coursework for speech and language pathology. It just would have been impossible. Like it, it literally would have been. So thank goodness I had, you know, a, a disabilities office who cared about that and made that a priority but so you know i think about that a lot where i wanted to do i thought about going into speech but i'm like well we don't have an embosser like how on earth would i have gotten that done you know yeah, yeah. i think that you know a lot of the a lot of the time now even some tvis and some people who work in the blind community uh they don't really think about how important braille is i think um, one of the few advantages to go into a blind school <laughs> is that you just you learn braille you learn braille mm -hmm. you yeah. everything is in braille for you all your textbooks are in braille like you grow up learning how to do it and yeah. i can't say a lot of great things about where i went to school but i got some great braille instruction out of it yeah 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 and you know i think that whatever we can use um especially if we could use both you know whatever more tools we can have is better definitely uh, uh -huh. for sure yeah. definitely okay so lily's asking besides ira i know um why can't all people with disabilities have equal access to whatever they need 
for uh, their specific needs to accomplish school and in life? Funding. Yeah, <laughs> oh, it has a lot to do with financial. Mm -hmm. um, and then it also has a lot to just do with like lack of awareness and like mm -hmm. ignorance. And so, like I said, so many people think like, oh, you know, I can give you an electronic version that's equal access, but like, it's not, if it's not accessible and if it's not, if not all the pictures are described. Exactly. And, and also I think your own personal comfort level, because yeah. I know for me, like going where I go to school, I have to be comfortable answering question after question, after question, having meeting after meeting, after yeah. meeting, like, yeah your personal comfort level with just like being vulnerable. Like we don't want to say our disabilities make us vulnerable, but they do because there's such a lack of awareness and kind of, if you're not comfortable breaking that stigma and like making people aware, it's just a lot harder, but I think yeah. mostly it has to do with money and, and what you have available to you based on how much, where you go and what's afforded and what yeah. economical, oh man, I can't talk. The economic situation looks like, but also just a lot of it is you and, and how you handle blindness. I know a lot of blind people that don't like questions and get offensive and, don't, you know, and that proliferates that stigma, I think. I also think, like you said, Jess, like it is a personal attitude thing, right? Like I think it's, you need to be proactive. If you're a blind student, you need to be so proactive. I remember I, I told someone like, if I got paid for the amount of like, time I spent on emails like coordinating things yes like, like, literally I think I read somewhere disability is a full-time job and I'm like That's <laughs> yeah like it takes a lot of time it takes so much extra time to like send out emails every week mm -hmm. and be like hey what are we doing this week what do I need to do what do you need from me, well, me like, with this to get you know, this set up and that set up and, yeah. you know I think I could be wrong I'm sure it's I think it's like 35 percent of people blind students graduate college it's some really low number. It's really it's, low. And even yeah, less than that, graduate in like four years. Yeah. And, and you know what? So. There are times I look and I'm like, I get it. Because I think yeah. a lot of times, you know, I've always taken full credits, always taken 12 yeah. to 18. Like I've never been able yeah. to like not reduce a course load. And I'm like, if I have to send one more email, like it just yeah. gets, it's a lot. And I get it. People don't do it because it's exhausting. And sometimes you know, for me, and I think for Joy, we've had professors that have been relatively understanding. We've had offices that have fought for us. But if yeah. you don't have that, you do. I know people that like mm -hmm. just want to give up because it's like head against a brick wall. Nothing is getting done. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And then the, like what Joy was saying is that some some of the professors or some of even people from the accessibility department, they'll say, oh, it's accessible. Yeah. But then you actually go through it and then you go through the graphics and the tables yeah. and the, the equations and everything. And it's, and it's not. It's not. Uh, one thing I do want to clarify, Lily was asking, um, I know uh, she knows what Ira is. And uh, does the school give you, give it to you or do you have to pay uh, personally? I have to pay for it. So like in Jessica's case, she advocated to get Ira, um, Ira access, which is like uh, free Ira you at her school. Put like uh, an area of, like where you want it around. Mm -hmm. So campus has it on. Which mm, is yeah. So but. But generally, um, if you can use a free promotion that they have, or you can be in a place, in a different place that um, is an ac IRA access point, um, otherwise you do have to pay for it. It's very expensive. It's ridiculous. My friends and I, my friends that are college students that don't have access, will call me and just go, I burned through all my minutes. It's ridiculous. They extort mm -hmm. people. It is like, it's like a, a hot button topic for me. I could go on and on about the annoying price plans of Ira. It's insane. I think Ira has blacklisted me because, anyway, I don't even need to go into all this, but I pretty much demanded a refund for something because they didn't give me my money back. Mm, I'm going to yeah. audio message you to tell me the story when this okay. is Okay, But yeah, no, literally, like, every time <laughs> I try to use Ira, it just cuts off after two seconds. What? Oh, my yeah. God. I didn't know they Anyways. could do that. I don't know. I think they blacklisted me, but so yeah. But my dirty laundry. Another alternative is be my eyes, right? Yes. So that's a free app, and but yeah. those are the thing is the difference is that be my eyes are volunteers. And I was so, like confidential. Like I would use yeah for like credit card information, mm -hmm. records, like. But yeah. also like well, there. I mean, you 
it depends on the agent too for Ira, yeah. but usually for Ira, you know, they know most of the time how to help you and like, you know, how to do that. But sometimes on Be My Eyes, you know, you never know what kind of volunteer you're going to get. I mean, yeah, there's so like many friendly kid. ones that are really helpful. And then yeah. there's some, I think I some read others some, that are something not somewhere so that was like a, a, a Be My Eyes volunteer was colorblind and, and lied saying that someone looked good. Oh, no. Good. Like, it was a while ago. Like, it was something about a shirt color, and they didn't yeah. know. They just said yes. I don't remember. I, I do use Be My Eyes for, like, things around the house. Like, um, you know, if something isn't labeled, like, oh, like, how do I set this timer or what? Like, I've used it for things like that, but I would never use it for, like, school or, yeah, like, personal, mm -hmm. like, sensitive information. Yeah, Ira has – see, it's, it's again, it's, like, you – it's very much, like, a you get what you pay for kind of thing, yeah. and it's so yeah. awful. They had distance learning um, in, like, March through June when the pandemic hit. And everyone I've spoken to is like, why can't they just bring that offer back? Because most people, most blind people are still, still just mm -hmm. Yeah. Ugh. Well, probably yeah. for funding as well, because. I know, I know. Yeah. I just, the extortion, like, it's like, it's one of the topics. Like, I will get on well, my. the thing is, you know, but also expensive. they have to pay their agents too. And I know. All that training and all that. And it's, so. It, it, I know. They so should. It's a, it's a I just wish they had issue. a tier for college students. So, you know how it's like. Thirty dollars for thirty minutes. Like we should get fifteen. Oh, yeah, like how Amazon oh, has students. like the the an Amazon yeah. and yeah. other places have like the yeah. student discount. Yeah, like it's just half off. Like I really wish they would do that. So we're still paying, yeah. but we're like because we 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 don't like make a lot of money. You know, like yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so somebody said for textbooks you can use um, Bookshare. Who is this? Um, Tabitha yep. says for textbooks you can use Bookshare and Learning Alley for audiobooks. And if you're a student, you get their membership um, at a discounted price or for free. And the thing yep. is that, yes, that's true. And even with Bookshare, if you get it soon enough, you can send it to them and they can mm -hmm. make it into an accessible format. But most of the time, they either don't have the book or there's just not enough time to make it to go yeah, through there's like, a lot the so yeah for my school we get um we can like look on our registration page and view you know, like we get the emails of the professors like really really early so again privilege thing like i'll email and be like hey can you just send me what i need textbook wise and but yes it's very and then also i just don't like learning allies audiobooks i don't, I don't like it either i've never used learning allies. i never i've only used them if there is literally no other yeah. option because yeah. there's no way to copy text there's no way to annotate there's no way to book like it's like you yeah, can't the readers sound terrible <laughs> what the readers sound terrible i know i appreciate what they do but it's just yes. mm -hmm. i can't use it as an academic that needs no. to no. from textbooks yeah I uh, another thing with Bookshare to keep in mind is that it works if your books are just straight up text so mm -hmm, like yes. English history that's yes. great but like for my speech and language pathology books that just wasn't going to work because they have tons of graphics tons of tables tons graphics of, yeah yeah like so mm -hmm. again Bookshare is wonderful it is such a blessing and actually being in seminary it has been so helpful because most of my books are just text but it's not always a yeah. great option, mm -hmm. unfortunately. So, yeah. Yeah, and I do want to say that. Uh, oh, Lily's ass. Um, give me a second. Where did it go? Um, okay. So she's talking about Iris. So it's not a good thing to use, especially if you're not good financially. Um, so. Yes and no. Um, if you're at an access point or where you can get Ira for free, I would definitely go with Ira. Um, but you know, for for what you need, I if think, you can't pay I for it, you know, use like my five eyes. free minutes a day. If you um, yeah. five, yes, there's also five free minutes a day. Like if you have a really small task to do, right? Yeah. Um. Because a lot of things don't just take five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was. Again, I really had to check my privilege being home because I don't have Ira at home. And I'm just like, I need to be on campus because I <laughs> have anxiety. And like, like with the five minute timer, I'm like, oh, my God, like I freak out. I'm like so nervous. That I'm it's That's so different. bad. Oh, yeah. So like for me, I try to save the Ira just in case I actually need like something that yeah. that 
need some somebody who either can confidentiality or like somebody who, inaccessible websites I yeah think tra training. Training. yeah whereas like be my eyes you know for other yes less less yes. sensitive tasks and yes stuff, for sure. things like that yeah 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 well this has definitely been such an awesome conversation you guys are awesome so thank, thank you so much you so joy much and us. jessica for coming on here and it was just a blast to see like the different perspectives of I know. It made somebody who went to mainstream and i've never thought about yeah and school for the blind so um it's getting to be about oh, it's already past 11 so we're gonna like, go ahead and like draw this to a close but thank you to everybody in the chat um you know oh if you also, want we both to have youtube channels yes so if you want to reach out i have an email on mine so you can like um, so the links for Joy's um, and Jessica's YouTube channels are in the description of this video. Um, and so definitely check them out. It's Joy Who, J-O-Y-H-U is the last name. And then Jessica, it's J-E-S-S-I-C-A. -S and then her last name is K-A-R-I-M. And those are the names of their YouTube channels. So definitely go check them out if you want to learn more about, you know, college related, school related, and just like, you know, um, anything <laughs> to do with them. They're, they're awesome. And um, and if you want to learn also a little bit more about each of them, um, they were actually on the Live Accessible Spotlight. And I will link that in the description to um, each of them shared a little bit about themselves and, you know, just their journey. So um, thanks again, Joy and Jessica, and we'll chat later. And thanks everybody again and Thank have you. a good night. Thank you.